Stephanie is the president of the Center for the Steady State, or excuse me, Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. His book, Shoveling Fuel for a Runaway Train, explains that he came to studying economics somewhat by accident. Uh, Czech is a biologist. He received a PhD in renewable natural resources from the University of Arizona. He was led to the study of, economic, of the economy when it became clear that the lives of wildlife and natural ecosystems are shaped by economic policy. Studying elk habitat, marine and forest ecosystems, and the use of natural resources led him to become proficient in economic theory. And I would really recommend for those of you that are uh, unfamiliar with the vagaries of economics that um, Dr. Cech has been able to successfully put economic theory into uh, lay people's terms and to make it rather digestible. So it's, it's a pleasure to read about economics in a way that is uh, kind of like in English. But uh, what Dr. Cech has done is point out the imbalance between healthy ecosystems and economic policy. Putting these systems back in balance is one of the basic goals of the steady state agenda. There are others, but I will leave this to Brian Cech uh, to explain if he chooses to do so. Is this a good time now? May I please introduce uh, Brian Cech? He's just arrived this mo from this morning from Washington, D.C. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's really nice to be here. I haven't been out west in a while. Uh, I lived in Arizona for 10 years, and uh, I moved to the Washington, D.C. Beltway to work in the, uh, the National Office of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, I should say that, I should clarify, I'm on leave from that government job, <clears throat> uh, partly because, largely because, you really uh, cannot talk about economic growth in any sort of negative light uh, and get away with it politically in the federal government, especially at this particular point in time. But e at any point in time, uh, I would say in most of our lifetimes, and that's a pretty scary, scary thing when you think about it. Uh, but anyway, I, before I really get rolling with the slides, I really want to thank Jeff for organizing this, this uh, venue. It's, I'm really sorry I missed the first talk. I did see part of, or most of the last one, which was great. And uh, I did read uh, much of the book that the first talk was about, so you know I feel pretty good to go on there. But uh, yeah, I'm going to take a. I'm going to have a little different focus than the earlier speakers, and I say no, we can't. Of course, um, it's a play on words from President Obama's "Yes, we can" campaign slogan. Uh, but the subtitle is "What We Can't." do and, and, and in two different ways. And I guess I'm going to pose this challenge to you up front. I'm not going to tell you right now what the two different ways are that we can't stimulate economic growth beyond the limits. But there are two meanings to that subtitle, stimulating economic growth beyond the limits. And so, you know, if you're really paying close attention by the end of the, or by maybe two thirds of the way through, you will see the two different ways that that subtitle makes sense, okay? Does that make sense? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm clarifying here, I'm representing a nonprofit organization, the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. It's an organization I founded in 2004 after uh, ascertaining that it was politically suicidal to try to raise awareness of the trade-off between economic growth and other uh, important goals as a federal employee. So I actually have three different hats that I wear at different times. There's my federal government, the day job, I call it. Uh, I'm also a visiting professor at Virginia Tech in the, what they call the National Capital Region of Virginia Tech. I teach ecological economics. And, uh, and, then, and then I'm the founding president of CASI is the acronym for the center. 
And I think it's really important that whenever we talk about economic growth in any sort of analytical way or way uh, with any sort of policy implications or political implications that we are clear on exactly what it is and as well as what it isn't in some cases. Uh, economic growth is simply an increase in the production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate. And that means it's, it's typically expressed in terms of gross domestic product. And that also means that it entails increasing population and or per capita consumption, per capita production and consumption, right? And this phrase is particularly key to uh, clarify up front when you have these kinds of discussions. Why is that? Well, you know, I, t I tend to use the, uh, the metaphor of the 800-pound grill. We talk in the federal government uh, and in a lot of other places, I, I presume, people have this, this at least a nagging sense that economic growth is uh, actually the cause of a lot of problems as well as the, you know, as well as a presumed solution for other problems. But seldom are the, the uh, seldom is it, is it explicitly dealt with, because as I mentioned, it's, you know, politically uh, not comfortable to do that. But we're going to, you know, identify the 800-pound grill in the corner, bring it out of the corner, and watch it grow. You see, that's economic growth, okay? That's not economic growth. That's not increasing production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate. That's why that phrase is so key, because I guarantee you if you start to raise awareness of the trade-off between economic growth and environmental protection, somebody's going to say, well, wait a minute, there's no conflict there. You can have, you know, growing uh, solar panels, you can have green growth, uh, you can grow these green sectors, I'm sorry, that's not economic growth. That's a sectoral readjustment, such as you could imagine the gorilla's head growing and the rest of the body shrinking. Well, it's crazy. That, that's not economic growth. It's a sectoral readjustment. That's economic growth. So it's really crucial to uh, keep that phrase in the aggregate in mind when you talk about this. Well, we had the gorilla there. Speaking of wildlife, I just want to mention, uh, and I think... I think Jeff already mentioned, this is how I got into this business. You know, I, I sometimes wish I hadn't, but I was, a, I was a biologist. I spent much of my career in the field, and uh, it was a blast. And then I, I went and I worked on uh, a policy analysis of the Endangered Species Act for my PhD, because I wanted to get into conservation policy at a national level. And so, one of the aspects of this policy analysis was to look at the context, and one of the ways I did that was to, to look at the causes of species endangerment. Why are these uh, 877, I think, at the time, federally listed? Why were these 877 species listed as threatened or endangered? Well, this is why. Urbanization, agriculture, water diversions, recreation, pollution, Domestic livestock, mineral gas, non-native invasive species, direct harvest, and then uh, modified fire road construction. It's the economy, right? If you and if you look at this, it's this economy has a a structure that very much reflects the structure of the economy of nature. And the economy of nature being all the non-human species out there. And philosophically, you can include humans in that economy of nature as well. Or you can say, well, that's separate either way. We'll look at it both ways. But in how many ecologists do we have out here or ecology students or biology students? Oh, or environmental sciences, uh, uh, natural sciences in general? How many? So. 
I, I should have asked this before, because this would be relevant to what I focus on and stuff. I'm sorry. I, uh, so how many economics majors or, or professionals do we have? Uh, I think we got a, uh, how many uh, in the social sciences in general? I think we got a lot of bums that just walked in off the street or something. <laughs> Are you sure there aren't more people with natural science uh, backgrounds or studies, biology, ecology, phys physical sciences? Well, okay. Uh, well, then in the economy of nature, you don't have anything going on without this foundation of producers. They're actually called producers in ecology. That they're plants. They're called producers because they produce their own food via photosynthesis. And then everything else are, you could say, is some form of consumer. Uh, you have primary consumers that directly eat plants. You have secondary consumers that eat primary consumers. Uh, and, you know, at the, ver at the apex of this economy of nature, you call those things, sometimes you see them called super carnivores. You know, wolves and, and grizzly bears and what's the, the critter here? Wolverines, right? You know, super carnivores. You know, and then there are some species that, that aren't that easy to classify in these simple trophic levels like scavengers and decomposers and pollinators. Uh, and uh, loosely speaking, you can call those service providers and they sort of operate throughout this economy of nature. And, you know, our human economy, uh, as we saw in the last talk as well, it, it also is founded upon producers. And that's the agricultural and extractive sectors, uh, the surplus of which frees the hands for the division of labor into manufacturing sectors and service sectors. And uh, now, like I say, you don't philosophically have to parse these out, the human and non-human economies. Well, let's say you're including them as one, in one economy, a human inclusive economy of nature, then clearly humans are the, the super carnivores. You know, they can pretty much uh, obtain any resource that, that, that they really uh, set their sights on. And uh, the service providers are a mix of human and non-human uh, entities. Poll pollination services, for example, can be provided by non-human species naturally or by non-human species with uh, human intervention or physically, mechanically by human beings. So uh, the point here is that the earlier slides that I showed you with the causes of species endangerment being like a who's who of the American economy, that was empirical evidence for this theoretical framework that also tells you this, that tells you the same thing. Because now you can recognize that to expand the size of that human economy, it in effect exerts a trophic compression upon the rest of the economy of nature. Very, very uh, fundamental conflict. Here's another way of looking at it. As the economy grows, Remember, in the, in the aggregate, so it's indicated by GDP, here you see it growing in sigmoid fashion toward uh, its environmental capacity. Uh, it's a process of reallocating natural capital or land in the, in the classical uh, terms of factors of production. But you reallocate natural capital. What is that? The, it's wood, water, soils, fisheries, minerals from the old economy of nature where that natural capital had comprised non-human habitats, right? On over to the human economy where it's, con where it's transformed into consumer goods and services and also uh, uh, capi uh, manufactured capital, right? This is pretty much common sense, I, I think. This is a fancy way of saying what you can see right when you walk out the door or, you know, take an airplane and look down below you, you see this going all uh, going on. 
all over, and you would have seen it historically uh, uh, in this fashion. And that's the, in the uh, wildlife and fisheries professions, we've studied this a fair bit. It's by now, it's standard fare. Uh, uh, it's, it's widely recognized that, uh, well, I love this, what do you call it, collage or something. It's a picture speaking thousands of words. Because here you see the economy coming out of the, the proverbial wilderness and developing its agro-extractive sectors and, and the rest of the breadth of the economy, even into the urban service sectors. And as it does so, it, it began, in, as it does in most countries, by uh, pushing out these large-bodied K-selected species, they call them in ecology. Uh, but little by little, it's... It's um, building out into every little nook and cranny of the old economy of nature until you're even endangering these little R-selected uh, species. So you can, I tell my students, you should be able to summarize this, this relationship between economic growth and biodiversity conservation with one sentence. And, and then I give them a hint that they might consider this sentence, which is due to the tremendous breadth of the human niche, which further expands via technological progress, the human economy grows at the competitive exclusion of non-human species in the aggregate. <clears throat> so there's that, that key phrase once again. Human economy growing goods and services in the aggregate, economy of nature dwindling, species in the aggregate. So what this all uh, implies then is that if, if we want to really be serious, as Congress was uh, very much when the Endangered Species Act was passed and <clears throat> as the country was uh, and as uh, probably a much smaller proportion are today, but to the degree that you are serious about conserving biodiversity, then you have to get serious about maintaining what we're going to identify now as a steady state economy uh, sufficiently below that carrying capacity. Oops. Sufficiently below carrying capacity so as to uh, maintain a, an adequate allocation of natural capital for non-human species, right? Ideally, <clears throat> an optimum amount of natural capital. You know, the amount that where society recognizes, oh, yeah, that's the right, that's a good amount of biodiversity out there, uh, and yet we also have a very well-developed economy. Okay, uh, so, You've seen the, the basics about why there's this trade-off between economic growth and biodiversity conservation. What's your response? I, I had a hard time pegging where you people come from because nobody raised their hands. So. <laughs> but I can, you know, and, and now is probably not the time to open it up for dialogue. But after years of, uh, of having this kind of dialogue in, in a lot of different venues, you get to know what the what the responses are. And there is one at least very relevant and important uh, valid type of response. It is, well, what about technological progress, right? And so that's what we have to explore next. And we have to explore, is this trade-off between economic growth and biodiversity conservation reconcilable via technological progress? Or is it even more fundamental than that and, and not to be reconciled? Now, I think that with the ground I'm supposed to try to cover here, especially to make it more relevant to the other two speakers, I may really plow through this part on technological progress, but I want, if you're interested, I really would like you to dig up this article. If you Google it, you'll find it. It's published on the internet as well as in the journal Conservation Biology. It's also going to be chapter 7 in my 
book, uh, which should be out next year, Supply Shock. But in any event, uh, it's a, we start with by recognizing that uh, economic growth theory has gone through three major stages in the past 60 years or so. It started with the solo model of the 1950s and then went through uh, some iterations where Robert Lucas, for example, was very involved. And now we're at the state of the art today is with this uh, model of, uh, of Paul Romer's. And the one thing they have in common is <clears throat> they all revolve around this, this production function that says production is a function of capital and labor, right? How many people have seen this production function? I know you've seen it. <laughs> you probably wrote it. <laughs> Gee whiz, uh, really? Come on, be honest. How many have seen this production function? Has anybody here taken a basic business course? This is a mystery to me. What? <laughs> well, okay, this is like the, one of the core equations of, uh, in economics and business. Production is a function of capital and labor. And I, I have a whole other chapter in Supply Shock on how, how this became a landless production function. As the classical economists talked about, the factors of production were land, labor, and capital, right? There are political reasons why it was corrupted into this uh, landless version. But in any event, we don't have time to go into that. This is, however, explains some aspects of economic growth theory today as it implies uh, policy. Like I say, started with Solo's model. Beautiful. These are all, by the way, very, very nice. Uh, it's very nice work, but not in all respects. He did, Solo, uh, by the end of his paper, identify technological progress as the requirement for increasing economic growth in the long run. Uh, but he didn't know how to deal with the process of technological progress. In other words, as they say in, in economics, he treated it as an exogenous variable. It wasn't endogenous to the model. In fact, uh, he began to refer to it at some point as like manna from heaven. Uh, I believe actually others use that term and somewhat pejoratively in speaking about Solo's work, but eventually he kind of co-opted it himself. And uh, the point being that uh, it happens, and he and other neoclassical economists then study growth, assuming that it happens. All right, now we skip through the years, we get to this excellent article by Romer, endogenous technological change. He solves the equation, if you will, for technological progress vis-a-vis -vis economic growth. He points out that, he points out that, yeah, production is a function of capital and labor, but don't forget, labor can be of various sorts. And, you know, we could say, paraphrasing this, that uh, there's regular old labor, and then there's the labor that's devoted to research and development, or R&D. And patenting plays a key role in the, uh, the ability of R&D to, to catch, if you will, in the economic process. But for our purposes, the main thing to, to, to uh, recognize then is what it does to our basic model of reallocating natural capital Let's say that we were at technology level T and, and we're also now recognizing a universal carrying capacity. That's capacity for that human inclusive economy of nature, right? And at this level, well, we, we still had X amount, let's call it, of natural capital allocated to non-human species. <clears throat> so, the hypothesis is then, if you think you can reconcile growth with biodiversity conservation via technological progress, you're saying that as you proceed technologically from level one to level two, you essentially have this 
capital-free, natural capital-free growth zone, and so you retain the entire, say, X amount of it allocated to non-human species. Now notice you're implying that somehow, somehow, <coughs> well, ran out of natural capital. The, the, uh, <coughs> I should say uh, converted natural capital. Let's just, here's some. Uh, you're implying the universal carrying capacity is, is growing, and how is that happening? Uh, you know, eventually you run into the teeth of basic thermodynamics. You know, neither energy nor matter is created nor destroyed. And furthermore, uh, this technological progress, it's all about increasing productive efficiency, output per unit input. But our second law of thermodynamics establishes that you cannot achieve 100% efficiency. Well, theoretically, it's possible, but only in infinity. So it's not going to happen, in other words, in any policy-relevant manner. And, uh, and, and uh, well, enough of that for the moment. But you see there are some, some uh, uh, weaknesses of the hypothesis right from the get-go. The problem is, if you're going to get anywhere in terms of policy, uh, policy improvements and political dialogue and stuff, you can't be resorting to laws of thermodynamics. You know, you hope that students like you of unidentified curricula are, are getting the laws of thermodynamics. I know in our natural resources program at Virginia Tech, you don't get out of there without a thorough beating of the second law of thermodynamics and, and the implications for many different things. But uh, for more public dialogue, we have to uh, deal in different currency, if you will. And, you, and there is a way to do that. It's talking more uh, explicitly about research and development itself. Uh, so here's where we start. We say, uh, where does it come from? And this is, this is barely considered in uh, the national policy dialogue on, on science and technology policy. It's <clears throat> recognized that obviously it, it's got to be financed. <laughs> it's got to be bought. It's got to be purchased. And that's about the extent of the discussion. You know, it's sort of like uh, blindly looking for pots of money to put it in some kind of R&D, both both of those two uh, efforts are, you know, not very rigorously analyzed or, or conducted. But to put it a little more succinctly, it comes from profits and in a more general sense, economic surplus. But I choose to use the word profits because in the U.S., for example, it's 76% corporately funded. And in many other ways, R&D is a function of profits. But at the very least, it's a function of economic surplus. You know, there is no money for research and development until the factors of production, the land, the labor, the capital, the rents, the wages are, are paid. And, uh, and then whatever's left over after that, you can invest in, in research and development. All right. Where does that take us? It takes us into a, a real problematic economic scenario because economists of all ilks, pretty much uh, throughout the history of the profession, have recognized that profits dry up. It's a natural economic law. Iron law of wages, and you know, uh, there's a, a whole structure that entails that profits dry up in a competitive uh, capitalist economy. Except, except for the firms that somehow develop and try to maintain then a competitive advantage over the others. Profits don't necessarily dry up for them. Well, what's the stock answer for how they do that? 
it's R&D. So now we have this catch-22. You know, you need the profits to maintain the R&D, but you need the R&D to maintain the profits. So are we missing something here? And this is something that, that I looked for for years, and I think the answer is actually really simple, but uh, uh, it's one of those things where it looks a lot simpler, you know, after, after you find something. I happen to be looking through a, a review by, in Rostow's book on economic growth theorists from David Hume to the present. He has a long portion in there about the, the uh, national income accountant, Edward Dennison. And it's from there that I think we find the answer to this question. There is something else going on here that breaks that catch-22 and allows the process to continue. It's called economies of scale. It's the other way of getting increasing productive efficiency, except that this way, by definition, entails increasing the, the size of the operation at current levels of technology. And we already had established that that is in fundamental conflict with biodiversity. So, yeah, and economies of scale operate from the micro to the, to the macro scales. And, uh, you know, here's an example. Same basic technology. This is much more efficient. More efficient. But that doesn't mean it's any less. It, it, it's much more efficient while at the same time being tremendously more impactful on the environment than that. So the conclusions of this part are that economic growth requires technological progress. Yes, everybody agrees on that. And by the way, technological progress requires economic growth. That part tends to get overlooked. It's not really a catch-22, though. There's economies of scales that are sort of the catalyst for this process. And it, but that means you don't reconcile that trade-off between economic growth and biodiversity conservation, or for that matter, economic growth and environmental protection in general. Yeah, and to put it back in these terms, yeah, you, this was the original hypothesis that was wrong. You actually did end up reallocating natural capital and having less available for non-human species, and it matches every lick of empirical evidence there is. Now, just a smidgen on neoclassical versus ecological economics. Uh, you know, this is the, okay, how many have seen this? Or some, hmm, I think I see a hand or two that would have seen that other thing as well if they saw that, but whatever. You know, your economy is modeled in basic econ and business textbooks as a circular flow of money between firms and households, right? And the idea is you want to you wanna make that, that flow efficient and you want it to grow. These are the two main goals in uh, neoclassical economics. And Herman Daly, uh, an economist who worked in the World Bank for close to a decade, uh, saw something wrong with that. He said there's a key feature being left out. So he is, I would say, sort of the grandfather of our movement in ecological economics, which does account for laws of thermodynamics and principles of ecology. And then there are other foci on the equi equitability of the distribution of wealth and, and allocative efficiency as well. But this, is, this issue, the sustainability issue, or the scale issue, where sustainability is the goal, is what really distinguishes ecological from neoclassical economics. So in ecological economics, we don't deny that there is a circular flow of money. Of course there is. But there's a, a lot else going on. That circular flow happens to exist within a planet. And it also it, it required these natural capital inputs. 
once again, you know, building upon the last talk, and due to that second law of thermodynamics, must produce as a by a co-product or byproduct pollutants, including materials and, and waste heat. And this really helps, I mean, for today's problems pertaining to limits to growth and environmental problems and all that, doesn't it seem to help a bit to, to consider what there is besides just that circular flow and what the context? It helps you to see the issue of scale, the size of the economy relative to its containing, sustaining ecosystem. Oh, how did I get to this part already? Well, okay. What about optimum scale then? Because we've been focused on, you know, uh, the trade-off between economic growth and environmental protection, implying that there is a need for a steady state economy if you want sustainability and environmental protection. So then that brings up the concept of optimality, uh, optimum scale in particular. What, what is it? What's the optimum scale, all things considered? And also, is GDP a reliable measure of scale? And could, uh, oh yeah, I don't know if we'll get into this part. Could ecological micro, does anybody know what that means, ecological microeconomics? You've heard of valuing natural capital and, and ecosystem services? You know, like estimating the value of having a population of honeybees and in this part of the landscape, the services that provides to the agricultural economy, that kind of stuff, that's ecological microeconomics. We're talking primarily here about ecological macroeconomics and that scale issue. Okay, in terms of uh, scale uh, and, and in terms of growth paths, <clears throat> we recognize that perpetual growth is unsustainable, you know, it, and, and recognize that at this point in history, you still can't get, and, and no offense to anyone who may be here, uh, but you still can't get a conventional or neoclassical economist, or very many of them, to acknowledge that there is a limit to economic growth. And this is really hurting this country and our prospects for sustainability, much less optimal scale, because uh, when it comes to issues of uh, economic policy, who do you think most people would turn to? They would tend to turn to the, well, let's see, who deals with economics? Oh, economists. And there's the Chicago School with a, a gazillion of them, and they got a gazillion publications, and you know, they're on the Council of Economic Advisors, etc. It's a real problem, folks. Uh, but in any event, the rest of us, I think, get it, that you can't have perpetual... Oh, by the way, the, if, any, if you ever encounter a Chicago school or any uh, wild-eyed growthist that says there's no limit to economic growth, it's easy to, to uh, refute that. You just point out that to think that there's no limit to economic growth on a finite landmass like Earth is precisely, it's, it's mathematically equivalent to saying that you can have a steady state economy. Let's say today's $73 trillion global economy, that you could have that on a perpetually diminishing landmass. So eventually you could tuck it under the podium here and you know, classify the rest of the world as a designated wilderness area. It's crazy. It's precisely mathematically as ludicrous as saying that there is no limit to, to economic growth. So that's not sustainable, and of course, you know, that's not sustainable, and neither, that's not fun either. So there's one remaining option of the three basic options, and it's the sustainable one. That's what we call steady state economy. But what about the optimality of it? And, you know, this is an issue where your optimum may not be my optimum kind of thing. If you're, uh, you tend to be, as they say, biocentric and 
say you're a bit antisocial or whatever, you just want to be out in the woods, like most wildlife biologists like me, you know, for us, that optimum GDP would be a bit lower even than the current. Uh, all else equal, you know, none of us are enjoying watching a failed growth economy unfold before our eyes and the, you know, the, the difficult uh, situations that causes for families and, and, and uh, organizations and everything. But other than those issues, uh, we're only considering biodiversity and, and your, you know, preferences pertaining to environmental space. And, you know, there are some down here, some here. You know, you might say it's a more anthropocentric perspective if you would prefer to be a, uh, in the middle of New York City instead of out in, in bountiful Utah. So as a democratic polity, we struggle to find that, that optimum, right? And uh, here's another way of looking at it. And uh, hint, hint, I kind of alluded to something early on in the talk. But <coughs> if this is GDP and, and this is the human welfare, uh, we see that when you're beyond that optimum, you can't really even call that economic growth in that sense. You may still have increasing production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate, so you, you do have economic growth in its most basic sense. But in another sense, it's more appropriate to call it uneconomic growth because the costs are greater than the benefits. And, you know, it goes back to, what do they call it in microeconomics, the equimarginal principle of maximization. You know, you can map it out, and it's, uh, it's where the marginal utility of growth equals the marginal disutility. It's also called the when-to-stop rule in microeconomics for a firm's production. And her, here we're saying that's relevant as well to a macroeconomy. And there, beyond that, that uh, point, you have uneconomic growth. So, you know, there is no one metric out there that tells us there are attempts to develop these metrics, but right now we have a hodgepodge of metrics that give us hints all around. You know, we've got GDP itself. Uh, we've got these green GDP efforts, got the ecological footprint, genuine savings indicator, the living planet index, millennium ecosystem accounts, and so on. And when you look at it this way, it helps to consider what they, what they usually refer to as the three pillars of sustainability, uh, ecological, economic, and social. You know, sometimes you look at them as uh, the legs of a stool kind of thing. Usually it's recognized that you need to integrate these considerations and, and then what we additionally point out in ecological economics, akin to that earlier slide, is that that economy once again is a wholly owned subsidiary of the economy of nature. And so we don't want to lose that focus, but temporarily we're going to say, well, considering these different spheres, we can sort of categorize these types of indicators, uh, and I'll just mention a few things about these three, I think, and because these tend to be more at the nexus of environmental and economic affairs, although the genuine progress indicator is pretty well a comprehensive type of uh, indicator. So we have evidence for uneconomic growth at least with the ISEW, showing that in a number of countries, anyway, uh, while you continue to have GDP growth, your index of sustainable welfare declined. And the, usually this, in some of these countries, this uh, is uh, beginning in the 70s, uh, approximately. <clears throat> Pretty good paper on this. It's a bit old by now, but... Uh, 
it's, uh, it's very compelling. S same type of uh, finding with the genuine progress indicator. GDP continues upward and, and their genuine progress doesn't see. And do does this not resonate? Here's another way of looking at it. There is a burgeoning uh, happiness literature right now, and it's, it's very uh, linked with ecological economics literature because it's focused on that scale issue, a lot of it is, and pointing out that beyond this, what is it, 9, 10, 11, $11,000 uh, per capita approximately, there doesn't seem to be a gain from further increase in per capita income, in terms of happiness, satisfaction, in general. <clears throat> now, we do know that GDP is, is very linked to energy, and uh, I think we're rapidly getting beyond the point in American political history now where that's in any way denied. <laughs> For years, it, you had to fight your way to, you know, to raise that awareness that the economy is based on natural resources, material and energy. That's pretty much established from all ends of the, from all as, uh, portions of the political spectrum. A few of us looked at this uh, relationship between uh, uh, endangered species listings in GDP and you know it was not at all surprising. We don't want to ever get caught in the trap uh, as scholars of saying that uh, correlation proves causality. In this case it's just one more bit of evidence that's supportive of the that theoretical and other founda empirical foundation for the trade-off. Okay, so now Normally in this talk, I wouldn't talk about this issue, but this was a big part of uh, the, uh, what got the ball rolling, I guess, to begin with. And, and so I just want to say a few bits about it. Uh, here's sort of the old a standard approach to looking at the spectrum, the political spectrum, and we could note that it's really a spectrum of political economy. You recognize it left and a right and communism and fascism their way on the right. But uh, hey, wait a minute, what happened here now? The fascists are back over here on the left. Remember that old Johnny Cash song, the one on the left was on the right. And so how did they get over there? They're so far out they kind of wrapped around and wound up in this person's view on the other end of the spectrum. Crazy. Well, in fact, here's the insanity explanation. They just say any extremist, right or left, they're just nuts, and it doesn't really matter where you put them. The point I think I'm trying to make with, with these few slides is it's a limited approach to looking at the issues that we have to consider today. Yeah, it, it's relevant that there is such a thing as capitalism and, and there's communism and the old Cold War rhetoric, you know, but in, in less heated terms, it's basically a spectrum from laissez-faire to central planning. And, uh, yeah, this old way of looking at things, that's kaboot. Because, for one thing, you tend to forget the fact that there are mixed economy. Well, that spectrum doesn't forget that fact, but it doesn't really point out either that for some goods and services, a market truly is appropriate and a, and a relatively freely operating market. These are rival and excludable goods. Uh, but then you have many types of public goods and services. Defense is the classically recognized one. Environmental protections and other and then others that the market's not going to provide them. So, you know, you gain a little bit of uh, rigor by viewing, uh, by adding another spectrum in there and then looking at these quadrants from, in this case, planning to 
free market and authoritarianism to individualism. This is another fairly common step upward in political science. But our main question now at this point in the, in the venue, I think, is may capitalism be reconciled with a steady state economy? And I think the answer has been, uh, you know, a bloody no. <laughs> However, I think, dang, whoops. We, got, we have to think of our own way to look at, uh, to add value to this spectrum from let's say fair to central planning. And I think the key other axis to look at is uh, our recognition of limits to growth. If we don't recognize that, we're still operating with the old empty world rationality. And if we do recognize it, we could call that full world rationality. And so this issue about whether or not capitalism or social, don't forget the Cold War was like a, a, a race where a score was kept with GDP, basically what it was. So, you know, not to be too obnoxious, I, I would say, it's the goal, stupid. <laughs> you know, if your goal is a steady state economy, I think you're able to encompass a broader portion of that spectrum and, and make it work. Uh, whereas if it's not, then chances are it's uh, not uh, likely to occur, and no matter what, where you are on the spectrum anyway. So your steady statesmanship, of course, increases as you recognize the fullness of the world for further economic growth. Okay, let's now maybe the propensities for a successful for successful steady statesmanship are a little further toward the planning, and I don't doubt that at all. But I think the way I would put it is. The way we tend to approach it at Cassie is we're not, uh, we avoid the radical tag of, of being, uh, you know, red Marxists or whatever and being uh, hell bent against the capitalist system. The way we tend to approach this is it, number one, it's the goal that matters first. You got to put the horse before the cart. And number two, uh, uh, I forgot what the second point was. Uh, horse before the cart. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll think of it with the next slide. Anyway, in any event, I mean, oh yeah, the second point was that we've got in this country a constitution. And, you know, this country's system is oftentimes referred to as capitalist democracy, right? But I don't think it says in the Constitution you will be a capitalist democracy. You know, it provides for a mixture of uh, approaches to the economy and, and its management. And uh, so I believe that the Constitution of the United States has the capacity to host, if you will, a steady state economy, a sustainable steady state economy. But take just a hell of a lot of political development and will. Okay. Maybe that's even the case, but you, you'd say, prove it. Now here's a little bit about how much time do we have yet? Do I have till 2.15 or? Sure enough. Okay. And I do want to leave some time. Q&A, but uh, just a bit on the ecological microeconomics. So these are some of the ecosystem services that are being talked about in, in the context of developing markets for them so that they can be incorporated into a capital. This is where I would say capitalism doesn't cut it. You know? But not only that, what's, I think what's more or what's less able to cut it, if you will, is growth. Here's what I'm getting at. Here's you see the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, a very authoritative body on sustainability issues in general. 
and they're sort of uh, waxing, hopefully, on this, this growth of the carbon market. It may grow to some 44 billion by 2010. It's not still growing because this is a partial year here, but you know, the point was that carbon markets were at that time thought to be rapidly growing. And now it's time to revisit some basic economics. You know, we, we're talking about ecosystem services here and the prices thereof. And uh, the basic idea is that as, as those services are deemed more valuable, i.e. prices increasing, uh, suppliers are going to come forth and provide more of them, right? That's the basic, basic theory. <clears throat> and then, of course, you add in the demand curve, and you can identify price at equilibrium. But let's focus on the supply curve for a second. The thing that has not been uh, rigorously analyzed is the origins of the money. And once again, this is where I connect quite a bit, I think, with the last speaker. But <clears throat> we go back to the trophic structure of the economy and the trophic origins, indeed, of money, real money, adjusted for inflation with purchasing power parity. We see that that amount is a function of agro-extractive surplus that frees the hands for the division of labor and makes money a, a meaningful concept. So in other words, the real money supply is basically a, a measure of ecological footprint or environmental impact or biodiversity loss, all those things. And here's another uh, way of, of demonstrating that. And uh, I, I like to call this the trophic conundrum because there's all this, you know, where people are, are becoming enthused about the fact that the prices for ecosystem services are increasing and therefore there's going to be more and more investment in them. What's being forgotten about is they're rising simply because this whole supply curve is shifting inward and that leaves us, we're, we're left with less money to be able to generate to pay for them. Yeah, here's another way. How are we going to pay for the increasing amounts of ecosystem services? Uh, we're going to do that by liquidating increasing amounts of natural capital to generate the money to begin with. In other words, we're going to be doing it by liquidating the fund. You know, natural capital takes two forms. It, it's a stock flow form and a fund service, a forest of trees there. It's a stock of timber. It's also a fund for things like carbon sequestration. <clears throat> so the very thing we were, thought we were going to save, we're eroding, you know, kind of digging out the foundation to build the roof type of thing. So uh, this is what I recommend to students as well as scholars in ecological, if you're just building your tenure track or you're you know, developing your programs and foci and all that. This microeconomic stuff, there are people that made big names for themselves by now, but it leads to the trophic conundrum every time. Now, the macro alone, as I can, I can testify, <laughs> It's tough sledding. I mean, I'm looking at a five-day suspension right now in my, my day job with the federal government that's very related to these efforts to raise awareness of the trade-off between economic growth and environmental protection. So it's tough. I think the uh, most productive approach is to combine them, you know, get your foot in the door with the valuation of ecosystem services and then start pointing out things like the trophic conundrum and the fundamental trade-off, those kinds of things. That's like two tracks for a sustainable train. Well, now there's a part uh, that may not have to come into play for this venue, just from a talk I gave in uh, Bogota a couple months ago on the implications of all this for international diplomacy. 
Well, I'm going to refer you to my book. I didn't. I don't have any copies, so I didn't bring any copies. But shoveling fuel for a runaway train. Uh, this provides, I believe, and it wasn't intended to at the time, but I think it provides a framework for international steady statesmanship. I'm just going to tell you very quickly that it hmm, describes uh, a way to have, for there to be a, a class-based, peaceable revolution, steady state revolution, you might call it. It's not based on, you know, procuring or uh, expropriating the factors of production, but rather it's based on consumption behavior. And the basic idea is that as the, the majority of us, as we begin to, to recognize that this type of wantonly wasteful consumption, it's bad. It's bad for your kids and your grandkids. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for most of our uh, common goals that we have. It's just not good stuff. It's, and the more that, you know, and, and we, it's readily recognizable. Why? Because by definition, I mean, it's conspicuous. <laughs> so it's, this is something that can play out in society real easily. I'm going to skip a couple slides here. But, you know, it's basically based on this, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, you know, if everyone recognizes, or the vast majority does, that that's bad, irresponsible, ugly behavior, you know, that's hard on the self-esteem of the individuals who's, uh, who are being targeted by that attitude. And... Uh, and that's a prime motivator for behavioral change. That's the whole point of, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And here's an example, you know, this isn't just a bunch of theoretical gobbledygook. Here was a really uh, uh, applied example. Anybody remember seeing these posters? Oh, I forget, this is the audience that never admits anything. <laughs> well, I grew up in Wisconsin. We used to see these things walking down the hallways in school. And, you know, it didn't make much of a difference at the time. A lot of us wanted to get out and have a smoke at the break or whatever. But it, eventually, it did make a difference. You know, this stuff is, is uh, ingrained in your mind. And then lay, uh, as years went by, uh, this campaign made a big difference in the rate of smoking in the United States. It was a, it was a tough, long... Uh, battle, uh, but, you know, it, it, uh, it was very effective. And this smoking and, and conspicuous consumption have a lot in common. I mean, they're both conspicuous. They both impact public health. You know, we need to emphasize that it's, it's not just a matter of irresponsible fun-making with your Hummer and stuff. You're impacting the lives of others, and especially someone's kids and, and their grandkids. And, and both of these things, smoking and conspicuous consumption, can be socially constructed so that, you know, you can very much tap into uh, very motivating um, factors of, of the human psyche. All right, so now you might, I'm running out of time. I just want to get through a few more and then open it up for Q&A. Uh, you might say, Jack, why do you, why you keep talking about uh, attitudes toward conspicuous consumers and, and the conflict? Why, why aren't you talking about all these policy tools that you might use for steady statesmanship? And, <clears throat> you know, so I have a little pop quiz for you. Which one of these things you think will work? That's a good point. <laughs> you know, 
for most rational goals, I, I think that's the winner, right? You got to put the horse before the it's There's no chance of reforming the political economy unto sustainability or equity until there is widespread public awareness of the trade-off between economic growth and environmental protection and, and economic sustainability and national security and international stability. So this steady statesmanship, I think there is the potential for this to uh, uh, be evoked in, in international diplomacy. You see some tidbits of it already here and there. And, you know, just like with individual Americans, you can readily recognize liquidating and steady state classes. And, uh, you know, the easiest metric is GDP per capita. Uh, and if we, you know, in some talks, there's time to look at things here. But look at the food aisles. That, that's always, uh, you know, a good place to start. The diversity and accessibility of the food in a country is a, pretty much tied to the welfare. And uh, so the idea is that uh, the UN is a logical starting point for this. There's a Rio 20, a Rio plus 20 conference uh, that'll be in Rio de Janeiro next, uh, next year. And this is one venue in which we will be, you know, trying to uh, practice a, a smidgen of steady statesmanship, probably not from any country sponsorship yet, but from the NGO world, which is invited. <clears throat> and he, but there are countries expressing an interest in taking this approach, so that's one of the things we're working toward. Main thing is, once again, you gotta put the horse before the cart, and, and, then, and then politically probably there will have to be some solidarity developed among these steady state nations, uh, you know, and there's some hints of that type of Thing going on, like with the G80 and, and those types of uh, those types of uh, networks. Okay, run uh, and last thing I'll introduce is this phrase of backtracking. You know, you look at uh, the ecological footprint and, and you follow it to its source, and that's something that should be, and it's starting a little bit, especially in things like climate change uh, diplomacy. But uh, I think it's a hope for the future alternative to war because that's the other natural outcome of exceeding carrying capacity. So, you know, the idea is you have this trickle-down consumption. You get the poverty-stricken nations out of that mire and, you know, you... Uh, you shoot for that, even though it's, you know, as, as, as uh, difficult as that and impossible as that may sound today, what's the use of not trying, right? And I'd say the last metaphor I'm going to use is the, the metaphor of the runaway train. You know, I, if I were uh, forced to a gambling table in Las Vegas and forced to bet, will there be successful steady statesmanship any time this century? I think I'd, I'd have to bet against it. Uh, there's just so much inertia and power concentration and all that to overcome. However, I do believe that even a runaway train can be slowed. We may not stop it, get it down to a sustainable speed, but it can be slowed before the really, you know, horrific... Uh, devastating crashes, supply shocks, environmental uh, uh, nightmares and all that. So, and, and to the degree that it is slowed down, well, then that leaves some prospects for future generations to pick up the pieces. So, uh, oh, I forgot to click that button.
Yeah, and so I, I, I a while back stopped taking invitations to these things unless I have the opportunity to pass around the Cassie position on economic growth, which is uh, uh, it basically a summary of what you've seen. And it, I would say the main thing it does is it refutes that political rhetoric that there is no conflict between growing the economy and protecting the environment. In fact, it, it describes uh, that there is a fundamental conflict. The back of these things have the actual position on it, and I highlighted what I think are the key phrases. And you know, if you sign this thing, you're joining uh, the likes of E.O. Wilson and, and Gus Beth and David Suzuki and Van Dana Shiva and people like that that have, uh, uh, you know, figure out a lot of these things for a long time. Thank you very much. I, I, do we have any time for Q and A at? An hour. We have the idea of a steady state is fascinating, and I appreciated towards the end the real practical politics of trying to get there, as you talked about it. But I'm also intrigued because earlier in your presentation, I forget which index you used, but if I recall the index, you had two curves, and one was showing probably non-economic growth. In other words, it suggests that we've already passed the possibility of a steady state, and we perhaps as a global economy, now I'm moving past your chart, but perhaps as a global economy, we're already on that downward, less efficient side, mm -hmm. and so that means we have to do what you were calling their backtracking. And so I'm really wondering, what does a steady state look like, not in terms of the formalities of the model, but in terms of, because there you would just say it looks at this in terms of the economic curves. But rather, what does it look like? How can I reach that? How can I understand it in terms of what it might mean for my life and the life of people here in the room if backtracking is where we need to go? Well, there's a lot in that, in that comment question. Uh, there's a, there is a related political movement more prominent in Europe, La Decroissant, they call it. I don't know if I'm seeing it right. But it's uh, degrowth. They recognize, uh, they would agree with you that there's plenty of evidence that, you know, the further growth is, is not sustainable. So they're going straight, but it, it, our approach at Cassie is that, remember that one graph you had, that being unsustainable and that being unsustainable? Your, go your ultimate goal, if you want sustainability, would be some type of steady state economy. We don't deny that you may need some degrowth first. The backtracking, that had more to do with uh, tracking a nation's ecological footprint, you know, back to the source. Uh, yeah, but that, the, the whole ecological footprinting um, aspect of the ecological economics in academia is designed to get to this question of, is there any more room for long-run, uh, sustainable-type growth. Time for one more? OK, one more. Um, how much longer do experts predict uh, the natural resources will last before you know, we, uh, we hit rock bottom? Yeah, well, of course, that varies uh, regionally quite a bit. I mean, there are parts of the world with localized supply shocks. Uh, and the, I would say one of the, the books out there that, that you might be interested in is called Resource Wars. It's about developing hot spots in the world where nations are, are starting to become bombastic uh, and are likely to go to war over resource shortages. Mideast, Caspian Basin, uh, North Africa are are pretty clear examples. But uh, the one last thing I would mention is the, one of the recent developments in the literature pertains to the, uh, the crucial nature of uh, rare metals in the economic production process. And maybe the panel can shed some more light on that. That's not an area of my expertise. But this person ha evidently has developed a fairly compelling hypothesis that it may not be the 
the water and the timber and the fisheries that are the limiting factors for economic growth, but rather the, you know, the rare metals that are used in uh, a number of manu key manufacturing processes. And one last question. Um, okay. When you were talking about macroeconomics and a steady statism, you uh, briefly alluded to speaking out and getting a five-day suspension. What, what were you talking about there? Are there any federal employees here? <laughs> No, but you're in a you're in a culture that um, appreciates uh, authoritarian uh, uh, leadership and and social harmony. So uh, that's uh, why it's interesting. Ah, thank you. Uh, I uh, attempted to ask a, a past president question at, in an open forum uh, about what we could do in the, in the federal government to raise awareness of the trade-off between economic growth and environmental protection. And, and I was the next one in the queue. I had the mic in my hand and I, the, I, it was uh, very frustrating that the session ended right then and so the entourage with the uh, it was President Carter filed down the aisle of the auditorium and I filed in behind and I felt that there would be an opportunity uh, for kind of a meet and greet you know, with, with the president and I could broach the topic then. Well, the security uh, system there was uh, not the optimum, let's say, and when I uh, exited the auditorium at the end of this this group turns out it was in an area that was restricted <laughs> and the rest is is kind of a a longer story but that's the uh, the impetus and there may not be a suspension uh, or there there may be but uh, uh, you know, and there are some other aspects to it that we don't have time to go into, but that, that's the basics. That's it. Thank you.